I'd like to start out by, by thanking DeVore for putting together this wonderful series. He's really, he and Michael Shattuck have really taken the lead on this and uh, they've done a phenomenal job and I'd like to thank them for putting this together. Um, and I'd also like to thank the ISHR for helping to make it happen as well. And um, please join the ISHR if you're not a member. Uh, and we have, we have as, as Thomas Eschenhagen mentioned the other day, um, we hope to have a World Congress if uh, COVID-19 doesn't uh, cause trouble in, uh, in, in 2022 in Berlin. So anyhow, without further ado, I'll, I'll get to the seminar. Um, I'd like to talk to you today about some of our work looking at mitochondrial regulation of cell death. Um, and George, you're gonna have to give me control back, George, because I can't change the slides. So we're, we're with the tag team, we're trying to get this to work. Um, so I just gave you control back, so you should okay. Be able. okay, well. I'm not able to, hold on. Okay, there we go, all right, thank you. So anyhow, so basically, since this is probably a fairly broad audience, I thought I'd give a little bit of a background. And so I'll cover the first two topics, um, discussing kind of the, some of the background on mitochondrial calcium uptake and cell death, and also um, regulation of the mitochondrial permeability transition form, and I'll tell you what that is. And then I'll turn it over to George, and he'll focus on a regulator of the permeability transition for cyclophilin D, but I'll start with the background. So my lab has been interested for uh, many years, for over 30 years, in trying to understand mechanisms involved in regulating cell death. And, oops, and one of the mechanisms that uh, has, is, is, it plays a key role in activating cell death in the setting of ischemia reperfusion injury is an increase in cytosolid calcium. And this was proposed about 25, 30 years ago that one of the main mechanisms initiating death was this increase in cytosolid calcium. And we showed using NMR methods that there was indeed an increase in calcium which occurred during ischemia. Um, but we were interested in trying to intervene to block this increase in calcium. And so we needed to know the mechanism responsible for the increase in calcium. And the hypothesis at the time was that there was an increase and lactic acidosis and therefore an increase in protons. And this increase in protons stimulated sodium proton exchange and that led to an increase in sodium during ischemia, which, which we could measure with these NMR methods. And this increase in sodium then stimulated plasma membrane sodium calcium exchanger leading to an increase in calcium, which occurs during um, ischemia. And to further test this hypothesis and to show that this increase in calcium was indeed important in initiating cell death, um, we did experiments where we added sodium proton exchange inhibitors. And when we did that, we largely blocked the increase in sodium and attenuated the increase in calcium. And this was cardioprotective. We had improved recovery of function and smaller infarcts. So this suggested two things, that this pathway, the sodium proton, sodium calcium exchange, played a major role in bringing calcium into the heart um, and initiating cell death. And then if we were able to block it, we could reduce cell death. In point of fact, there was a large clinical trial, a Guardian trial, where they treated a large number of patients with sodium proton exchange inhibitors. But unfortunately, uh, in, in the setting of ischemia reperfusion injury, this wasn't protective. And it's fairly obvious in terms of looking at the preclinical data why that might be, because you can see this increase in sodium and increase in calcium occur during ischemia. So if a patient comes in and they've had a heart attack and you treat them with a sodium proton exchange inhibitor, unfortunately the horse is already out of the bar and you already have the increase in sodium and the increase in calcium. So not surprisingly, this wasn't protective, at least in the setting of ischemia reperfusion injury. So this then led the field to say, okay, what is calcium doing? Can we work downstream and inhibit some of the detrimental effects of calcium? And so the question is, why is an increase in cytosolic calcium detrimental? And some of the current thinking is that calcium enters the mitochondria and the mitochondrial calcium uniporter and activates a large conductance channel in the inner mitochondrial membrane known as the permeability transition pore. And so I'll tell you a little bit about this permeability transition pore, which I'll refer to as the PTP. This, this pore has been well studied in isolated mitochondria, and people have shown that an increase in mitochondrial matrix calcium or reactive oxygen species can lead to opening of this PTP. 
and these both are increased during ischemia reperfusion injury. When this pore gets opened, um, it, anything that's greater than 1.5 kilodaltons is now permeable across the inner membrane. So you lose the mitochondrial membrane potential, you can't generate ATP, and when oxygen comes back on reperfusion, the electron transport chain doesn't work as well, and you now generate a lot of reactive oxygen species. And altogether, the loss of ATP and the ROS bursts now lead to um, cell death. One thing that's interesting is the permeability transition pore has been, has been shown to be inhibited by low pH, which occurs during um, ischemia. So the PTP is inhibited during ischemia, but on reperfusion, when the pH is restored, now it becomes activated. So this gives a window of opportunity, um, unlike what happens with the sodium proton exchange inhibitors, where the calcium gets in uh, during ischemia, so blocking it on reperfusion isn't any good. Since the PTP doesn't open until reperfusion, this gives an opportunity to intervene on reperfusion. Um, one of the problems with studying the permeability transition pore is that the identity of the PTP is still debated at best. Um, so we don't know what the PTP is. Um, there is some suggestion, there are two papers um, that have proposed that um, different conformations of the F1, F0 ATPase can form the permeability transition pore. This is still somewhat debated. Uh, John Walker's lab has had data suggesting that this is not the PTP, um, but it's still, uh, it's still be under investigation. And I think it's fair to say that the F1, F0 ATPase is, is still the main, um, the, main, the main target that people have suggested is the PTP. It's still not proven, it's debated, but it's, it's I think, the, the, main, the main target right now. So since we're still debating what the PTP is, my lab is focused on trying to understand how cyclophilin D, which is an activator of the permeability transition pore, how that works. And, and it's fairly well agreed that cyclophilin D activates the permeability transition pore. Um, there are experiments where they knocked it out genetically and it just reduced ischemia reperfusion injury. And there are also inhibitors such as cyclosporin A, um, which inhibit cyclophilin D and are cardioprotective, at least in animal studies. So, so basically, although we don't, we're still debating what the PTP is, there seems to be agreement that cyclophilin D is an activator with the permeability transition pore. But it, even though we agree that cyclophilin D is an activator, we don't know how it activates the permeability transition pore. We don't know, is it activated by, we know the calcium and ROS activate the PTP. Does cyclophilin D play a role in that? This is all largely unknown, and, and these are some of the studies that we hope to tell you about today. So before I turn this over to George, I want to just give you a brief introduction as to how we got into studying cyclophilin D. And we, we were studying for a number of years a phenomenon known as preconditioning. And this is where brief intermittent periods of ischemia and reperfusion protect the heart from a subsequent longer period of ischemia. And one thing that's very interesting about preconditioning, and that is that if you extend this fourth period of reperfusion, which is typically five minutes, if you extend that to 30 to 60 minutes, you lose the protection. And one interpretation of this is that there's a post-translational modification that's generated during the preconditioning period. And this post-translational modification is important for the protection. So people have studied preconditioning and they've found a large number of signaling pathways which are activated by preconditioning. But the question is, how do these signaling pathways or potentially the post-translational modifications that they generate lead to inhibition of the permeability transition pore, if that's indeed the key trigger of, of ischemia reperfusion injury. So a few years ago, we took the approach of focusing on one of these signaling pathways, nitric oxide synthase, which generates nitric oxide. And this is well known to be protective in preconditioning as well as other types of cardioprotection. We said, let's try and understand what some of the post-translational modifications that are generated by nitric oxide synthase and nitric oxide and how they might influence the permeability transition pore. And I should say that nitric oxide um, can activate guanyl cyclase, but it can also um, form another post-translational modification known as S-nitrosylation. And so NO can form um, can, can modify any cysteine in a pro cysteines in any proteins, um, and they can undergo um, this, this, this modification known as S-nitrosylation. And this is a covalent attachment of an NO moiety to a free cysteine. 
So a number of years ago, um, Mark Kaur um, wanted to understand what, what proteins could be S nitrosated with preconditioning. And so he took a perfused heart and he took a preconditioned heart and um, did some proteomic methods to look at proteins that were S nitrosylated. And we find at baseline, there were about 27 proteins that underwent S nitrosylation. But if we preconditioned, we got about 50 additional proteins that underwent S nitrosylation. And when we looked to see what these proteins were, one that particularly caught, there were a number that are of interest, but one that particularly caught our eye was cyclophilin D. And from our proteomic methods, we knew that it was cysteine 202, 202 in humans, 203 in mice, that that was the cysteine that was S nitrosylated. So we went ahead and used CRISPR-Cas9 to make a mouse where we mutated this cysteine to a serine in all the, the cells in the body, the cyclophilin D, um, the cysteine 202 to a serine. And when we studied this mouse, these were studied by Jun Lee Sun and George Aminakis, they found that doing this knock and mutating this cysteine to a serine was cardioprotective. That we, if we did this in a Langendorf perfused hearts, that we had, we, if we did 20 minutes of ischemia and 60 minutes of reperfusion, we had better recovery of function and smaller infarcts. So we're interested in understanding how this, how this cysteine and in cyclophilin D is important for regulating the permeability transition pore. And George has done a lot of work on this and I'll um, turn it over to him and let him, um, let him tell you about his studies. Okay, George, can you take over? I have to give him approval. All right, take it away, George. Okay, so thank you, first of all, Dave and Tish for giving me this opportunity to present uh, our data. So the working hypothesis we had is that uh, cyclophilin D, and especially the last system cyclophilin D, is responsible for targeting um, cyclophilin D to the PTP and triggering its activation. Um, furthermore, if if we go ahead, uh, give me a second here. I'm trying to advance the slide, but it won't do it. Yes, now it's there. So um, the second part of the hypothesis was that if we mutate uh, cysteine 202 or 203 to a serine that cannot uh, undergo a redox sensitive post translation modification, for example, oxidation that would uh, inhibit the targeting of cyclophilin D to the PTP. Or if that cysteine was previously s nitrosylated this would shield that cysteine from further oxidation, and that would again be uh, protective. Um, so this um, um, Hallestrup's group had uh, done lots of studies on this and showed that actually under conditions of uh, calcium overload or oxidative stress, uh, the mitochondrial cyclophilin, and this is cyclophilin D, uh, would be targeted to the inner uh, mitochondrial membrane. So, um, after seeing that the mice where the cysteine 202 of cyclophilin D was uh, mutated to a serine were, were protected, uh, we were interested in finding out uh, why this was the case. One possibility would be that um, the expression level of the mutant cyclophilin D would be lower than uh, wild type cyclophilin D. So we went ahead and compared the expression levels of uh, cyclophilin D in our knocking and wild type mice, but actually saw no significant differences. So since the expression level was similar, we then hypothesized that uh, the mutant cyclophilin D could actually alter calcium mutation capacity in the knocking mice. To assess this, uh, we isolated cardiac mitochondria, um, put them in a physiological buffer in the presence of an extra mitochondrial calcium dike called calcium brain 5N, and then did the sequential pulses of uh, calcium. Now, each time we add calcium, you see a peak in fluorescence. Uh, this is because the calcium, the calcium is localized initially extra mitochondrially, and then as the mitochondria take it up, uh, it drops back down to a baseline. And this is done repetitively until we reach a point where the mitochondria cannot take up any more calcium and they start spontaneously releasing all the calcium they have accumulated before. And this is what we designate as a PTP opening in this case. Um, if you uh, sum up all the calcium that had been accumulated prior to the PTP opening and you normalize it to the amount of mitochondria you have, we, um, we get what uh, we call the calcium mutation capacity and it's a measure of, um, um, of uh, measuring um, how sensitized the PTP is.
So on the graph on the left, you can see four traces. The dashed lines are mitochondria without any drug, and the continuous lines are mitochondria that were subjected to cyclospore A. The black lines are the wild type, and the green lines uh, are, uh, represent the knocking. And you can appreciate that the knocking in the dashed lines can um, take up three to four more uh, patches of calcium until PTP opening occurs. If you look at the summary on the left, you can see that the knockings have significantly, significantly higher calcium retention capacity than the wild types. So this tells us that uh, it is actually system 202 that induces a PDP opening and could possibly uh, increase ischemia perfusion injury. When we repeated the experiment with cyclosporin A, and it is worth noting here that uh, cyclosporin A is a drug that binds uh, to cyclophilin B and inhibits its uh, translocation to uh, the inner mitochondrial membrane and the PTP, we saw that we can elicit additional protection in the knock-in mice. This was kind of uh, interesting, and um, we, um, we wanted to see if this is the case in uh, intact hearts. So we, we perfused hearts from both the wild type and knock-in mice uh, with and without cyclosporin A, as seen on the graph uh, on the left, and we assessed infant size. You can easily see that uh, cyclosporin A elicited protection in the wild type hearts, but uh, in, in terms of the knock-in hearts, uh, cyclosporin A had no additional effect. And this is a slight discrepancy with the mitochondrial assay I showed you in the previous slide. Um, and it could be, it, the, I think the most reasonable explanation for this is that uh, the PTP regulation is slightly different in the intact heart than it is in isolated mitochondria. Um, and for example, um, you have in the intact heart the, also the influence of oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species that uh, is a variable that is missing in the, in the, in the mitochondrial assay. So summing up the, uh, the data this far, um, they show that histine 202 of cyclophilin D induces PTP opening and can possibly increase ischemia perfusion injury. Uh, since we hypothesized that the mutant cyclophilin D desensitizes the PDP, it made sense to assess the translocation of the mutant cyclophilin D to components of the PDP. Uh, as Tish pointed out um, previously at the beginning of the talk, uh, the major forerunner in the search of PDP components uh, is considered to be the ATP synthase. So we assessed the binding of cyclophilin D to the ATP synthase. We isolated cardiac mitochondria, we oxidized them with uh, phenyl alcernide, and then we APed um, the ATP with an antibody against the ATP synthase, and then assessed the outputs for the presence of cyclophilin D and subunits of the ATP synthase. You can see a representative plot on the left side of the image. Uh, here we probe for ATP5A, which is a subunit of the ATP synthase, and you can see that the signal appears to be the same across all the genotypes. Uh, but if we probe for cyclophilin D, um, you can see that the wild types exhibit higher amounts of cyclophilin D being associated with, with the ATP synthase than the knocking. And if you look on the graph uh, to the right, you can see that uh, this is about 50% less. So under conditions of oxidative stress, um, cyclophilin D in the knocking in, in knock mice is about 50% less associated with the uh, proposed component, uh, proposed PDP component ATP synthase which again shows that cysteine 202 um, can possibly promote the translocation of cyclophilin D to the ATP synthase and the PTP. So the data go along with our working hypothesis that uh, it is possibly a, a post-translational modification of cysteine uh, 202 or 203 that targets it to the PTP, possibly oxidation. And if we mutate that cysteine to a serine that cannot be oxidized, then uh, the targeting of cyclophilin D to the PTP is inhibited or if that cysteine had been previously s nitrosylated it's shielded from oxidation and uh, the targeting is also inhibited. Um, at this point, point we considered that uh, there might be crosstalk um, between different post-translational modifications on, uh, on that cysteine, and we considered another uh, PTM called uh, s uh, Now, s or commonly referred to also as uh, palmitylation, refers to the covalent attachment of a fatty acid, most commonly palmitate, to the uh, free thiol group of a cysteine on a protein. We also noticed that cysteine 202 matches an acylation motif, and we decided to assess uh, acylation of um, cyclophilin, the acylation of cyclophilin D. Uh, to do this, we used the commonly uh, used method called acylrac, uh, 
RAC stands for resin assisted capture. And briefly, we start with our lysets that contain our protein of interest uh, that on which some of the systems are free, depicted here by SH, or some of them have um, attached to them a fatty acid. And then we proceed by blocking the free systems with n ethylmalamide and this is irreversible under the conditions in which we run the assay. The next step would be to add a malt reducing agent called uh, hydroxylamine that strips off the fatty acids from the acylated systems. And now we use the resin to capture the free, uh, uh, the free systems that were previously acylated. And then after doing washes, we lose the NEM modified systems and we are left with those on the resin that were previously acylated. And then we can assess uh, the aerates by running Western blots. So for the next part of the talk, I'm going to be showing two blots for, this, for each experiment. Um, the inputs that would represent the sample, the lyset as it is um, right before running the acyl rack, and the outputs that represent the sample that has been enriched in acylated proteins. So it is worth noting before going further that uh, on in, in the mouse cyclophrenia there are six cysteines. Uh, four of them are uh, preserved across species and the last cysteine, cysteine 202 in mice or 203 in humans is uh, preserved, um, is also one of the preserved ones. So we were interested in seeing uh, which one of those uh, cysteines is the main acylation site. Uh, to answer this we uh, perfuse the uh, hearts from both the wild type and the knock-in mice and this is baseline perfusion without um, uh, any ischemic stimulus and we um, at the end of the baseline perfusion we took them ran the acyl rack and assessed them in the presence of acylate cyclophrenia D and as you can appreciate from the blood uh, the knock-in the knock -in mice exhibit about 60% less acylation in cyclophrenia D which tells us that cysteine 202 is possibly the main acylation site of cyclophrenia D. One of the things that uh, acylation can do is uh, affect the activity of enzymes. And since cyclophrenia D is a cis trans uh, isomerase that is acting mainly on proline residues, we decided to um, see if uh, acylation affects the isomerase activity of cyclophrenia D. To do this, we obtained the commercially available purified cyclophilin D that was incubated uh, in vitro with palmitoyl CoA. And in doing so, uh, this increased its acylation by sixfold. And then we went on to assess its uh, catalytic activity by using the standard um, enzymatic assay. This is based on a tetrapeptide that is isomerized from its sins to its trans conformation. Um, through cyclophilin D, and then it is cleared in its transconformation by trypsin, um, and it then uh, absorbs at 380 nanometers. An interesting fact about this reaction is that it can also take place without presence of cyclophilin D, and this is depicted by the black line in the middle graph. And you can also see the activity of, um, of uh, non palmitoylated cyclophilin D with the orange line, and the activity of palmitoylated cyclophilin D with the green line. And you can appreciate that there is um, uh, no difference between their activities. If you also look uh, on the graph at the, on the right, you can see that uh, the DMSO treated cyclophilin D and the palmitoyl CoA treated uh, cyclophilin D do not have uh, different enzymatic activity. It is also worth noting here that uh, we, um, the previous data from our, our lab have shown that the mutation of the last system to a serine also doesn't uh, affect the isomerase activity. So what are the possibilities then? Um, it can be that acylation and nitrosylation compete for the same system in cyclophilin D, and they might either synergize or have opposite effects. So acylation could be targeting cyclophilin D to the membrane where it can activate uh, the PTP, or acylation could be shielding uh, cysteine 202 from oxidation, uh, like S-nitrosylation does, and uh, reducing uh, PTP activation. So to find out, uh, what, uh, which of those hypotheses was true, uh, we decided to take a look uh, at what happens during ischemia. So we uh, perfused um, wild type cards. Um, a set of them was baseline perfused for 20 minutes. And then in those cards, uh, the acid rack was run to assess uh, the presence of acylate cyclophilin D. And in another set of cards, uh, we, uh, um, we subjected them to global ischemia for another 20 minutes 
And at the end of ischemia, we run the ACE lorac and assess uh, the presence of acylate cyclophilinity. And as you, as you can appreciate from the outputs, the hearts that were subjected to global ischemia exhibit less acylated cyclophilin D than the controlled hearts. And if you look on the graph on the right, it's about 50% less. So this tells us that cysteine 202, the acylation of cysteine 202 is downregulated during ischemia. And this was interesting and we decided to uh, find out why is this the case? What is actually causing uh, cyclophilin D to be deacylated to cysteine 202? To answer this, we considered um, two hallmarks of ischemic injury, um, the calcium overload, as uh, Tish mentioned at the beginning of the talk, and mitochondrial uncoupling. And we tested those conditions in um, uh, isolated cardiac mitochondria. So when we subjected uh, mitochondria to a pulse of calcium um, that could cause PTP opening, we saw that acylated cyclophilin D, the acylation of cyclophilin D was downregulated by about 40%, as you can see in the first set of the experiments and the first uh, summary plot. Um, Adding an uncoupler to mitochondria didn't have really an effect on the acylation of cyclophilin D. So this tells us that it is the calcium overload during ischemia that is causing cysteine 202 of cyclophilin D to be deacylated. Now everybody knows that calcium can activate the PTP, but the exact mechanisms behind these are uh, largely neglected in the literature. There is evidence from the Bernardi group that calcium can change uh, co the conformation of ATP dimers so that the PTP can form between the two molecules of the ATP synthase, but there might be also other possibilities. The data I just showed you suggests that under baseline conditions, cyclophilin D is acylated on cysteine 202, and this possibly prevents the interaction with the PTP, whereas under ischemia, the rise in uh, calcium, matrix calcium, uh, deacylates cyclophilin D on the last cysteine, so that cysteine is now free. And in the first minutes of reperfusion, it can be uh, oxidized through um, the influence of reactive oxygen species that in turn would target cyclophilin D to the PTP. Or in case there is a NO donor present, that system can be nitrosylated and the targeting of cyclophilin D to the PTP would be prevented. And at this point, I would like to give the speech, uh, the speech back to Tish for the remaining part of the talk. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yes. So, so George has, let me see, can I drive the screen back? Can you just go to the next slide, George? I don't seem to have control of the screen. There it goes. Okay, so George has shown you that cyclophilin D can undergo S nitrosylation, oxidation, and pomatillation at cysteine 202. Um, other people have shown that cyclophilin D on different sites can undergo other post-translational modifications such as acylation or phosphorylation. So cyclophilin D seems to be able to integrate signals from many different pathways and this can regulate um, its activity or its location or, or somehow we think is involved in integrating these different pathways into regulating the permeability transition core. But the question really is, I, I think most people do not think that cyclophilin D's main goal, main, main, main function in, in, in the mitochondria is to activate the PTP. We think it has a day job. And the question is, what's the day job of cyclophilin D? And there was this interesting paper that came out uh, a couple of years ago from George Porter's group, where he suggests that cyclophilin D might be involved in regulating the assembly and disassembly, actually the disassembly of the synthosome. It's known that the F1F0 ATPase, the anti-nucleotide translocator, and the phosphate carrier can come together in what's called a synthosome to, and you've got all the components now to make ATP, and this is a more efficient way to make ATP. And it's thought that, that the assembly and disassembly of the synthosome occurs based on the metabolic needs of the cell. And George Porter has suggested that cyclophilin D might be involved in regulating the disassembly. And it may very well be that these post-translational modifications are sensing different metabolic inputs that are involved in regulate whether the, whether the F1, F0, ATPase, the ANT, and the phosphate carrier are together in the synthosome or disassembled. And perhaps in the, when they're disassembled, they're now more prone to undergo PTP, and that might be part of what cyclophilin D is, is doing. <clears throat> 
And so I thought I'd end with that somewhat speculative thought. But, but essentially what we've shown you is that cyclophilin D can undergo a lot of post-translational modifications and they can clearly regulate the activity in the permeability transition core and perhaps they regulate um, the, the synthesome as well. And with that, we'll stop and uh, just acknowledge the people in the lab. Um, George obviously did most of the work, almost all the work that he talked, he did all the work he talked about. Um, Jun Lee Sun has been, uh, he's a staff scientist in the lab who's the, the guru on S nitrosylation. He worked with George, as did Maria Ferguson. And these are other people in the lab who are working on other projects we didn't talk about today. And we also have a number of collaborators that have been involved in this project. With that, we'll stop and take any questions that people have. Let me see, I have to go see if I can. All right, so there are some questions here. Okay, so, um, all right, so Const Const Constantino. Um, at calcium, as calcium is known to activate mitochondrial dehydrogenases, is there anything about the transient extreme NADH, FADH2 accumulation prior to inhibition of mitochondrial of the PTP? Um, I don't know, George, do you want to, you want to unmute? We can, we can sort of take these together. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that NADH is known to be very elevated during ischemia uh, and, and even reperfusion. So it's known that, that NADH, just because you don't have oxygen, NADH goes very high. Um, and, and, and I guess the question is, 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 this, is this involved in PTP formation? Um, I, I, so your question is, is the high NADH involved in PTP formation? Um, I'm not aware of, I mean, there, there were some data suggesting um, that, 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 that the redox state could be involved in it, but I'm not sure specifically with NADH. George? Uh, I don't think that either. I mean, this is a greatly, greatly I think, neglected part of, in the literature too, that uh, um, people talk about oxidative stress, but it's actually the ratio of NAD to NADH and FAD to FADH that is um, uh, w what we actually designate as uh, oxidative stress. But I'm not aware of uh, any studies that have specifically addressed uh, the accumulation of NADH in relation to the, to the PTP formation. So Priscilla Sato has two. I'll answer the second one first. Are these PTMs happening inside the mitochondria or in the cytosol prior to its translocation. So, so I think there are PTMs that happen when, when, when you do preconditioning or any of these cardioprotections. These PTPs, post-translational modifications, are happening in the cytosol as well as in the mitochondria. For s nitrosylation we actually find that a, a, a high proportion of the post-translational modifications are actually in the mitochondria. Um, and I think that NO, um, can easily diffuse into the mitochondria and, and activate uh, and, 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 and cause s nitrosation in the mitochondria. Um, I think that cyclophilin D is a matrix protein, so it doesn't tra it doesn't have it doesn't have to translocate. It's already in in the in the uh, mitochondria when it gets s nitrosylated. Um, another question that Priscilla had was. Um, how do we separate the effects of preconditioning on the PTP from its known impact on gap junction communication? Um, I, I mean, that's it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that that, that, that that clearly preconditioning is cardioprotective, and there may be multiple mechanisms by which it initiates that cardioprotection. I think one major one is inhibiting the PTP, um, but it may have other, um, other effects as well, um, some of which might be through gap junctions. I mean, I, I, I think that we obviously all focus on what PTP does to our mechanism of interest, but I think that it may be that ischemic preconditioning, um, and, and PC, the ischemic preconditioning has multiple effects and they all sum up for, um, for protection, George, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think I think you you addressed it well, and I also think that there is not at least there is not an easy way to distinguish between the two, especially in in vivo models. It's um, it's going to be tricky, but then again, it might be um, 
just an accumulation of, uh, of, of different stimuli that uh, what we designate under the term of uh, preconditions. So there might be different uh, ongoing mechanisms that contribute to the protection of the cell. So when does normally PTP open? During ischemia, will it be closed? Well, this is a very interesting question. And so I, I think that the, the, there, there's a lot of data showing that low pH is cardioprotective. Um, and, 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 and Dr. Bernardi and I think Hal Strip have also shown that um, low pH can inhibit the, the permeability transition pore. Now that's that's interesting because it, it only and if you if you read the pa if you read Dr. Bernardi's papers carefully, it inhibits it under de-energized conditions. So under de-energized conditions, low pH inhibits the permeability transition form. Exactly how de-energized they are during ischemia will will, will play a role here. Um, but but if you have de-energized mitochondria, low pH inhibits. Um, and that's that's been been shown fairly well. So so the the thinking is that during ischemia, pH is low and the PTP is inhibited, um, and so you have a window of opportunity on reperfusion um, if you get your drug there to inhibit the PTP before pH gets fully restored. This could be cardioprotective. Um, let me see. William Fuller, interesting presentation. Um, can you comment on? Hold on. I'm sorry. Um, can you comment on uh, the fraction of cyclophilin D that is acylated in the heart? So roughly the estimate we, we have would be about uh, 40 to 50 percent. So that's, that's a lot compared to other redox sensitive post-translational modifications such as nice So um, we think, we do think it plays a major role in activating the PTP um, just because the, the occupancy of on cyclophilin D uh, is uh, is very high. Okay, here's an interesting question from from Jason Carriage. Um, George, I'll take that. Yes. yes. So Jason is asking whether that we showed that the um, um, the interaction between the ATP synthase and cyclophilin D is 50% downregulated in the mutant mice, but the mutant cyclo, uh, cyclophilin D mitochondria are still responsive to cyclosporin A. And Jason is asking, how does the treatment of cyclosporin A on mutant cyclophilin D mitochondria disrupt the interaction between the ATP synthase and cyclophilin D to a greater extent? So uh, we actually looked at it. Uh, so we did, we repeated the same study as the one I showed um, with uh, Oxidan uh, in the presence of cyclosporin A. Um, we didn't show that data here, but uh, we, we didn't see a further uh, decrease in the interaction between the ATP synthase and cyclophilin D. Um, and again, I think, I think the reason we saw that uh, discrepancy that we can elicit additional protection in, um, in the knocking mitochondria with cyclosporin A, I think this has mainly to do um, with the fact that we omitted or didn't uh, take into account the influence that uh, reactive oxygen species uh, have or oxidative stress oxidative stress has uh, on, on those mitochondria. Uh, Jason is also asking a second question. Have you looked at other known interactions with cyclophilin D, for the example, the ANTs? Uh, this is a great question. Um, um, we, it probably makes sense to look at them too. And uh, um, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, the debate on uh, uh, core components of the PDP is, is great right now. And people even, uh, suggest there might be two modalities of the PTP. Uh, so I think, I think it does make sense to, um, to look um, at other known interactions with cyclophilin D. And um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great question. That's something we should do. Yeah. There's another question. Are chloride channels involved in mitochondrial cell death? Um, I mean, we haven't studied it, but uh, I would be surprised if, as I said, there are there are other pathways that are, are important as well, um, but we haven't looked at chloride channels um, at all. Um, here's another question for you, George, um, about the, uh, the acylating enzymes in mitochondria. Yes, so um, 
Uh, William says, uh, as far as he knows, there are no uh, plaques. These are the polymetal and the protein acid transferases, and these are the uh, the proteins that are actually uh, putting on the palmitate uh, on uh, the system where it's used. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a great point. Uh, there, uh, there, uh, there. As far as I can remember, there, there was a study, I think, uh, in 2017, uh, where uh, actually in the liver, uh, they would claim that one of those DHHCs uh, would be present. That would be DHHC13. Um, we haven't looked at it, uh, so we haven't looked if inhibiting uh, DHHC13 would actually influence the, the acylation of cyclophilin D. Uh, but this is this is a great point. Um, he's also asking, do you think acylation of cyclophilin D could be non-enzymatic in the mitochondria? This is another area of great debate that whether whether deacylation happens is enzymatic uh, enzymatically mediated by acyl um, thioesterases or if it's happening spontaneously. Um, we don't know. I think um, it, it would also be another uh, great suggestion to to look to look at uh, the same questions. Uh, from the perspective, which enzymes are responsible for the acylations, for the acylation of cyclophilin D, and which enzymes would be responsible for the uh, acylation? So here's here's a question on um, how would different numbers of mitochondria in different tissues of the heart, like PF, I'm not sure what PF is, in ventricular cells, affect cyclophilin D and cell death? Um, I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, 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 you might be asking if you have a cell type that doesn't have very many mitochondria, is this, is this pathway a major way of initiating cell death? And that's, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, obviously, cardiomyocytes have, have lots of mitochondria. So this could be a major pathway there, whether in, in a cell that has, has many fewer mitochondria, um, whether this would be, you'd get, you'd get sufficient, um, you know, particularly if you had a, a primarily glycolytic cell, would this have a, such a big component? And that, that's an interesting question. Although I will say that mouse embryo fibroblast, MEFs that we study, um, this seems to be, this pathway seems to be important in MEFs and they have much fewer mitochondria, although it may be regulated a little bit differently in MEFs. So um, it's a good question and, and I think it's an area that needs future work. George, anything to add? Okay, go on to the next one. What is the nature of the PTP? Is it, is it similar in interfibrillary and subsarcal level mitochondria? Um, actually, this is an interesting question. And people have suggested that um, it may be regulated differently. Um, and, and actually, June Wee Sun uh, looked at this. I mean, other people have as well. But June looked at it. The, hy the hypothesis was that the the subsarcolemma mitochondria, which are closer to the plasma membrane, might see ROS and, and, and some of these changes earlier, and they may be, uh, they, they may be the, 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 the main trigger that uh, initiates the PTP. I think it's an, an interesting area. I think there's some data suggesting it, um, but I, I, I think we need more data to, to clearly um, answer that question. Um, Let's see. Oh, go ahead, Devor. You would like to answer that? You have to unmute. No, no, no. I'm quite happy to answer it. I'm just helping you along with the. Uh, oh, I see. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Um, I have a basic question. Why don't you see cardio protection when you use cyclosporin A um, when, when you measure the area at risk? Well, we're doing. Um, Langendorf perfused heart. So the area at risk is 100%. It's a global model of ischemia. Um, so it has nothing to do, I mean, the area at risk is, is the whole heart. Um, I, I think we do see protection by yeah. cyclophorin A. Uh, George, you want to answer this? Uh, yes, uh, there was definitely protection when uh, we use cyclophorin A uh, in the wild types, both um, from, the, from the aspect of uh, calcium mutation capacity and uh, uh, in the measured infarct sizes, uh, the, where we didn't see additional protection was in the knock-in. So the knock-in was already protected at the level that the wild type with cyclosporin A is protected. And when we added cyclosporin A to the knock-in, we didn't see additional protection. Um, and again, this, uh, this is something that, uh, that intrigued us and um, 
I think the most reasonable explanation would be that uh, in the intact part, uh, you have both calcium overload and oxidative stress that are contributing to this, to the, to this chemical perfusion injury. Uh, whereas in the calcium mutation capacity assay, you only look at the aspect of uh, calcium overload. At least we only, we only looked at the aspect of calcium overload. It might be interesting to investigate a possible cyclophilin D A and T interaction. I, I, yes, that, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And I mean, I think Jason was sort of suggesting something similar. Yeah, I mean, yeah, clearly yeah. cyclophilin D has, at least there's d lots of data in the literature showing that it interacts with A and T. And, and I mean, as we talked about at the end, kind of with the synthesome, um, and, and Jason and, and Jeff Mulkinton have data suggesting that the adenine nucleotide can also form a pore, and it, it may be there are multiple pores, and, and, and that's, that's a great question, and it's something we need to do. Is the use of acyl donor molecule a potential therapeutic strategy, I'm sorry, I moved that, um, for the treatment of heart failure papers? There are some approved molecules that act in that way. George, you wanna? Um, well, it is, it is an interesting idea. Um, I should point out that the study we did, we did was uh, mainly focused on ischemia perfusion injury. And um, there might be implications in the treatment of uh, heart failure. So some of the mechanisms might apply to it too, but we need to do um, more experiments to find out what is the case in, uh, in the heart failure, uh, heart failure models. Um, we, I think we did consider back then to uh, use acyl donors to see if we can um, prevent uh, the deleterious uh, effect of ischemia perfused injury. Um, but uh, as far as I can remember, we, we didn't actually do the experiment. So, but but it, is, it is a great suggestion. Uh, as far as I know there, I don't think there is anything approved um, as far as acyl donors for the treatment of heart failure. Um, Tish, do you have anything to add here? Not, nothing to add. Um, another question is, um, why did cyclosporin A fail to confer cardioprotective effect in patients on the uh, circus study? I mean, this is a very interesting question. I mean, in, in most animal models, um, people find that uh, you know, cyclosporin A is protected. Um, and in the first proof of principle uh, trial, it was protected, but in the larger trial, um, it was not protected. And I mean, I think there are, it, it's still under debate as to why this is. I mean, as it, it's been pointed out that um, cyclophilin D is not the, the pore itself, it's just a regulator of the pore. And perhaps the regulation is different in, uh, you know, the, these PTMs can regulate it. Perhaps the regulation is different in, the, uh, in, 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 in patients with comorbidities. Um, the, you know, the, the, there, there, are, there are other possibilities as well. I mean, one thing I'll point out is that we have a, a mouse, a cycle, I mean, a MCU knockout mouse, where there doesn't appear to be calcium going into the mitochondria during ischemia and reperfusion, but this mouse, is, these hearts are not protected. Um, and this is a glow, this is was knocked out from birth or before birth. And so there seem to be some adaptations that occur and maybe these adaptations in, in the regulation of the PTP in it. And we think it could be regulation of cyclophilin D. So it could be that the regulation of the PTP by cyclophilin, which is what cyclosporin is working on, may be different in patients with comorbidities. George, you have anything to add to that? Um, no, no, I think you covered it pretty well. I mean, I really believe there, there, is a, there are many reasons why the cyclosporin A trial failed, but I, th I think you, you covered all of them. What are other factors that influence the closure of PTP? I'm sorry, it moved. <laughs> when I start to read them, they move. What are other factors that influence the closure of PTP? Um, for example, if there is a de de deposition of metals in the mitochondria that will lead to closure of the PTP, what happens if the same mitochondria undergoes ischemia? Um, I'm not 100% sure I totally understand the question, but so the question is what leads to closure of the PTP? I mean, there can be transient opening and closing of the PTP, um, but I think 
in, 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 in ischemia reperfusion, I think the thinking is that it's a more sustained opening and that once it opens, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't close. So I think you can have kind of transient openings where maybe you just have a, a few mitochondria that open and it doesn't s propagate throughout all the mitochondria. But in ischemia reperfusion, I think the thinking is it opens and it, 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 it's a sustained opening which leads to the death of the cell. So can I can I just uh, quickly just jump in and uh, I mean we you know obviously the questions will keep coming so is there <laughs> a time uh, I mean you've been absolute troopers because you've answered seventeen questions already and actually people haven't dropped off yet we've still got most of the audience here so you're clearly doing really well but so do you want to keep going or do you want to uh, you know answer a few more well, and then we'll answer a few we'll cut it off at 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 one is that so we'll answer a few more. Um, have you looked, is that okay? Absolutely, you go ahead. Have you looked at the effect, and there were two of us, so that makes it easier. Have you looked at the effect of um, cyclophilin D acylation on mitochondrial function, particularly in ischemia reperfusion, mitochondrial respiration, swelling? So, uh, it's something we one. very much so want to do. We, we did. Um, so uh, as you uh, remember the our knocking mouse uh, has the system doesn't have a system I'm told to it has a serine so that uh, and as we showed that cannot undergo uh, acylation so what we did was compare the wild type mice uh, with uh, the knocking mice in terms of respiration so we did look at uh, glutamate uh, malate ADP driven respiration but found uh, no differences there um, and the other thing we did on um, in terms of uh, functioning says was the uh, calcium retention capacity ones that um, I, uh, we, we, sh we previously showed. Um, so in terms of respiration, there doesn't seem to be a difference between uh, the knocking and the wild type, which in turn would mean that losing the acylation on cysteine 202 doesn't affect the respiration. There is also, so if you look at these mice, uh, phenotypically how they move around, how they behave, you can't really tell which one is the knocking, which one is the wild type, um, just by looking at them. Okay. Um, are there differences in the PTMs of cyclophilin D in young versus old, young versus aged? We haven't really looked at that. Um, no, we didn't look at that, but uh, we, as far as I can remember, we had considered the possibility that uh, um, acylation might uh, be up or down regulated with age, but it, it's a great suggestion. We haven't looked at it yet. And are, is there any evidence that NO donors or carnitine supplementation can target any um, PTMs of cyclophilin D? Well, certainly NO, if, if, we, if we give an NO donor, we get increased S nitrosylation of cyclophilin D. Um, but that's the only one that we've looked at. Yeah. I think so. Um, does cyclophilic isolation affect the MCU? Well, we haven't looked at that, but we've kind of done the opposite. And, and, and George has shown, I'll let you answer. So we looked, uh, since we, uh, we the, the, the main take home message of uh, today's talk was that uh, calcium deacylates uh, cyclophilin D, uh, so a rising calcium deacylates uh, cyclophilin D. Um, with respect to the MCU, we used the global germline MCU knockout mice. So these are based on a CD1 background and um, um, previous data from uh, Torrance lab and uh, our lab have shown that in those mice, the basal level of matrix calcium is higher than the wild type. So there we hypothesize that since they exceed, uh, it's lower, sorry, it's lower. So in the MCU, in the, in the global germline MCU knockout mice, the basal level of uh, matrix calcium is lower than the wild type. So we hypothesized that if we look at the acylation of cyclophilin D in those mice, uh, we would expect acylation of cyclophilin D to be higher. And uh, that's really the case. So uh, it really seems that uh, calcium can uh, affect the acylation of cyclophilin D. Uh, however, we didn't look at the opposite uh, uh, question of what you're actually asking if uh, cyclophilin D acylation affects the MCU. Um, that's also a good, um, a good comment. We have two questions that we haven't answered. One is the role of calcium and cardiomyopathy and heart failure. I think we need a whole talk on that. That's a, that's a big topic. And I, um, I mean, the PTP may play a role, although I think calcium and heart failure is, is a topic that 
would require a whole talk. And then the last question is, um, will it be possible to establish a link between the level or types of cyclophilin D PTMs and the inductance? I mean, obviously that's where we'd like to go. The question yeah. Do these do these PT and do they cross talk with each other? Does you know phosphorylation over trump uh, or does it does it does it overwhelm what we get with uh, palmitylation? You know how these all interact is 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 a great question and and is something that we're interested in looking at to see whether they do um, whether they do affect the regulation of the PTP and we're also interested in you know giving George Porter's data whether these PTMs regulate the activity of the synthesome and that's something we're also interested in looking at. I think that got us through the questions. <laughs> I mean that's quite impressive. Um, you have asked. Well we talk this, fast. <laughs> what is it? 20, 25 questions in total? Um, <laughs> so, I, so, so thankfully you finished in time. Well you had quite a sort of compact uh, presentation as well so they gave us a lot of time. So uh, probably the people would be interested to see the, the results of the poll. So 98% uh, said that they would like to see the cardiovascular webinars continue after the end of the series, which is end of June. Um, they, most of the people, 94% would like to, them to be in once a week, although I haven't actually offered other options to be fair. And uh, the days of the week, most of the people voted for Monday and Friday, but we will be running more polls. So this is not the only one. So, um, so, you know, we'll, we'll collate all this at the end. Um, uh, and actually, I will share the results with you just in case you're interested. So, uh, the one thing that I would probably just announce is that uh, we, we will have a, a really wonderful talk tomorrow as well. And that is by, uh, hopefully you can see my screen. That's uh, by Dr. Dunyak Sintievich from Queen Mary University. And the final thing that I would like to say is just those of you that are not members already that are interested in the society, uh, here's some basic information and then please feel free to, to, to look up what the society is about. And I'd like to thank the society for the support. And finally, I will stop sharing now and go back to the three of us. Um, I would like to thank Tish and George, a really, really exciting and engaging webinar. And I think you can see that by the number of people that have actually tuned in but also by the number of questions that you've had. Um, so, so thank you once again, and um, I think we will stop broadcasting soon. <laughs> thank you very thank much, Devorin, and thank you all for joining. This has been fun. <laughs>